Hi, and welcome to Accessing Core Market Exposure, Market Cap versus Equal versus Fundamental Weighting, the latest in a series of educational webinars developed by IndexUniverse.com. I'm Matt Hogan, Global Head of Editorial and President of ETF Analytics at Index Universe. I'll be your host for today's webinar. The format today is very straightforward. I'm going to deliver a 30-minute presentation providing in-depth analysis of the major alternatives to traditional cap-weighted indexing strategies. My goal is to examine both the academic theory behind these strategies and their real-world track record over the past few years. I'm going to try to cut through the marketing jargon and help you understand how to frame your own analysis of whether these strategies are right for you. Following my presentation, I'll be joined by two of the world's leading experts in alternative weighting strategies for an interactive, audience-driven Q&A. Joining me today are Tony Davidow, Managing Director and Portfolio Strategist at Ridex SGI, one of the leading providers of equally weighted ETFs, and Christian Wagner, CEO and CIO of Longview Capital Management, a registered investment advisor with offices in Delaware and New Jersey. Let's start at the beginning. Index funds, I think by any measure, are ascendant. According to the ICI, index funds have stolen market share from active managers every year for the past 15 years except one. And no, I don't know what happened in 2005. The growth of index funds has accelerated recently with the growth of ETFs, which have introduced new classes of investors and traders to the concept of indexing. The reason index funds are ascendant is simple. They offer low cost, tax efficient, and simple access to a wide variety of asset classes. Most importantly, as any fan of indexing will tell you, over the long run, the average index fund will outperform its actively managed peer by a wide margin, particularly after taxes. Index funds have proven themselves over decades, delivering exactly what they promise with relatively few surprises. They are according to some, the best investment vehicle ever created. Given all that, you might ask, why even consider alternatives? The answer, I think, is simple. Just think about recent market history. At the beginning of 1998, the tech sector accounted for just 13% of the S&P 500. In March 2000, that figure had ballooned to more than 33%. Index investors may not have realized that they were playing the dot-com bubble until they were caught in the dot-com burst. After the burst, many investors were dead set against repeating the problems of the past. They pushed product providers and indexers for new approaches to the market, and the result was a mini-boom in alternative weighting methodologies. First out the gate was the equally weighted S&P 500 index, launched in January 2003 by Standard & Poor's. People had been using equal weighted strategies and indexes for decades, but this was the first time it was done for strategic reasons as opposed to just ease of calculation. Investors didn't have to wait long to get their hands on this strategy, as just three months later, in April 2003, Ridex launched the first equally weighted ETF based on this index, RSP. iShares followed with the first dividend weighted ETF, DVY in November of that year. And a few years later, Rob Arnott burst onto the scene with his multi-factor fundamentally weighted indexes in 2005. Those were quickly replicated by a series of PowerShares ETFs. In June 2006, Wisdom Tree launched a suite of 20 dividend weighted ETFs, which offered investors for the first time the opportunity to swap out their complete market cap weighted portfolios with fundamentally weighted alternatives. All told, I count that there are now 76 equal weighted ETFs and 64 fundamentally weighted ETFs, and together they hold a not inconsiderable $40 billion in assets. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to ignore all the quasi-active index strategies that exist out there, which use complex, quant-driven black boxes to select and weight components. I'm also going to ignore more recent iterations including indexes designed to minimize portfolio volatility and boost sharp ratios. Today, I really want to focus on the main variants to market cap weighting, equal weighting, and fundamental weighting, which are the only strategies that have substantial live performance track records. I think the success that these strategies have had, as well as the limits of their success, 
stem from what I see as an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. The irresistible force in this case is the argument delivered by Rob Arnott, chairman of research affiliates and certainly one of the fathers of alternative indexing. Rob's classic quote is this, cap-weighted indexes overweight overvalued companies and underweight undervalued companies. That statement is inherently true. And what follows from it is the damning conclusion that any strategy that randomizes against this inherent misweighting seems destined to outperform cap-weighted indexes. Alternative weighting strategies don't have to pick the best statistic to weight things by. They seem to just have to pick the not market cap statistic. On the flip side of this equation, however, is John Bogle, who has his own irrefutable logic. Bogle's argument centers on the fact that before costs, investing is a zero-sum game. For every manager who outperforms the market, there must be another who underperforms. After costs, everyone's a loser. Therefore, if you have the lowest possible cost, which is exactly what market cap weighting delivers, you will outperform the majority of investors. Reconciling these two positions is difficult. Arnott's argument paints market cap weighting as destined to lose, and Bogle's argument paints it as destined to win. The truth, as always, lies somewhere in between. So let's dig into that truth. Before we do, I want to review quickly how market cap weighting works. In any market cap weighting system, the weight that a security gets is a function of a simple calculation, shares times price. There are modifications, and these can be important. These include adjustments for a company's free float, that is the proportion of its issued shares that is available for trading, as well as limits on the size of individual stock or sector positions within an otherwise market cap weighted index. You can get surprising results. These shouldn't be papered over. The free float adjustment, for instance, which exists for all major indexes, discounts shares held by insiders, the government, and others. For instance, although China is the second largest economy in the world, because of its limited market size and its huge free float adjustments, it currently ranks as just the ninth largest country in the MSCI All Country World Index. That's just behind Switzerland and just a smidge ahead of Brazil. That strikes me as ludicrous from an investor's perspective, but from a global investability viewpoint, which is how you build market cap indexes, that's the way it has to be. Equal weighted indexes, I think, are the simplest retort to the quote-unquote problems of market cap strategies. If the issue with market cap weighting is its propensity to overweight overvalued securities and underweight undervalued securities, a system that randomizes that without introducing other biases offers the purest fix. And at least recently, it's worked. Sticking with the S&P, the equal weighted strategy has handily outperformed the traditional S&P over the past five years simply by weighting each security in the index equally. Equal weighting strategies do help investors avoid the problem of piling into hot sectors during bubble moments. It's unlikely you'll see tech go from 13 to 33 percent in an equal weighted strategy as you did for market cap in the late 90s. One criticism of equal weighting, of course, is that it introduces its own sector biases, overweighting sectors that have a large number of small constituents. Most equal weighted indexes, for instance, overweight consumer discretionary stocks, as there are lots and lots of small consumer discretionary companies in most major indexes. One retort to that is the recently developed equal sector weighting strategies, which pays an equal share of assets in each of the nine major sectors, tech, telecom, materials, etc. But these, of course, have their own biases. Ultimately, they're not more right than market cap weighting. They're simply different ways of randomizing the bias inherent in any weighting strategy. Fundamental indexes do take a different approach. Rather than randomizing weights, they replace market cap with one or more fundamental factors, trying to arrive at the quote-unquote right approach. The most popular fundamental factor to base indexes on is dividends, with variations reflecting high yields or steady dividend increases or other ways of measuring the dividends a stock pays out. There are also ETFs based on earnings, revenues, and a composite of multiple fundamental factors. One thing is consistent across all these. Fundamental approaches are very sensitive to history and the structure of their particular methodology. While one index may be based on dividends over the most recent 12 months, another might be based on dividends over the most recent five years. 
Imagine how this would impact the weighting of financial stocks in an index. Many financial firms had huge dividends as recently as three years ago, but those dividends were cut drastically during the financial crisis, and they've yet to be restored. As a result, you see big differences in the weight allocated to financials in different fundamental indexes. The important point here is that fundamental indexes is not one category, but many. You can see huge sector and country variations within different fundamental strategies. One thing I want to note is that it's important to consider both the selection and weighting methodology when evaluating these strategies. Selection means how an index decides what securities get into the index and which ones don't. Weighting is how much weight each security gets. Equal weighted indexes typically invest in the same stocks as their cap weighted counterparts, while most fundamentally weighted indexes do not start from the same security pool. Instead, they base both selection and weighting on fundamental factors. That can lead to lower correlations for fundamental indexes and market cap indexes as they start from a different security pool. Before we dig into the tilts that these various strategies make, let's re-examine the big picture. There are some key advantages to market cap weighted indexes. Specifically, they have low turnover and very low management costs. These lie at the core of why these strategies work. Alternative indexing, by their nature, requires more frequent rebalancing than market cap weighted strategies. If IBM goes up in, market, in, in a market cap weighted index, its market cap will go up by the exact same amount as, as its price. So by definition, index managers won't have to do anything. In most other weighting schemes, as soon as IBM goes up in price, you'll have to sell. That increases turnover, which in turn increases expense ratio and potentially reduces tax efficiency. For the five years ending 2009, for instance, the average annual turnover for the S&P 500 equal weight index was eight times that of the S&P 500 itself. Uh, RSP's 28% turnover was in line with other alternatively weighted strategies, which generally have turnover between 15 and 30%. I think it's important to note that this is below the average turnover of an actively managed mutual fund, which ranges from 50 to 100% a year. Proponents of equal weighting and to some extent fundamental strategies will argue that the high turnover stems from the inherent rebalancing strategy, which they say will create a buy high, sell low discipline. That's true, but I think the high cost cannot be ignored. One thing that I, can be, I think can be ignored or can be at least um, qualified is the idea of cap gains tax risk. Lots of people talk about the potential for capital gains distributions in alternative index strategies as the rebalance feature seems destined to realize capital gains within the portfolio. But so far, we have not seen alternatively weighted ETFs pay out significant capital gains. The ETF itself is a very tax efficient mechanism, and I think that's worked to their advantage. Now that we've painted a big picture of what the world of alternative weighting strategies looks like, let's dig into the specifics. Because while I enjoy engaging in the philosophical arguments of Bogle and Arnott, what this really comes down to is what these strategies do in terms of market coverage and market exposure. I think in general, people may overthink things when examining weighting strategies. If you dig into the core exposure that these strategies give you, sector tilts, value tilts, market cap tilts, you can learn a lot about the expected pattern of returns. So let's start from principle one. When you talk about tilts, we consider cap-weighted indexes the baseline. That's not because they are right, but it's because they represent, in a very real way, the true market portfolio. This chart shows the sector weighting of the Russell 1000 since 1996, and it highlights what happens in a cap-weighted index during major market events. Can you spot the tech boom? It's the part of the sand chart that tips. That dip is actually tied to a huge increase in the sector allocation to technology and the concurrent reduction in everything else during the 1990s. There's no argument about what the right weight was here. The reality is that cap-weighted indexes can collapse in bubbles, and they fail to put money back to work once those bubble sectors go into recovery. That's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to capture the market portfolio. Relative to a market cap weighted index, an equal weighted index will overweight sectors with a large number of small companies and underweight sectors dominated by a few players. Compared to the S&P 500, for instance, the equal weighted version significantly underweights IT and energy and overweights consumer discretionary, materials, and utilities. 
an equal sector weighting system, which you can see in the right-hand column, takes different bets. It significantly underweights sectors with the largest market caps, like IT and financials, and overweight sectors with the smallest market caps, like materials, telecoms, and utilities. In backtesting, this creates a sharp drop in correlations with cap-weighted indexes during the dot-com bubble and bust. The index underperformed its cap-weighted counterpart during the bubble and outperformed during the bust, specifically because of these sector allocations. I think this slide is pretty key. Sector exposure is one of the dominant determinants of market returns, so it's worth examining these whenever you invest in an alternative indexing strategy. For fundamentally weighted indexes, the sector tilts vary depending on which particular index is used. In this chart, for instance, you can see that sector weightings between a large cap earnings-based ETF and the S&P 500 are virtually identical. This indicates that market values are heavily influenced by earnings, which honestly is just about what I'd expect. All other fundamental strategies currently significantly underweight technology, but interestingly, their bets in other areas of the market vary widely. The dividend fund highlighted here, for instance, significantly underweights financials, while Rob Arnott's PRF significantly overweights financials. The reverse is true in consumer staples. Again, it pays to examine the sector tilts closely before you buy any one of these strategies. Usually, you're making bets against the largest sectors of the market, which right now means technology, in favor of the smaller sectors, but that's not always true. Update a chart like this before you dive in. One common critique of fundamental strategies is that they are just dividend and value bets in disguise. It's a hard argument to settle, I think, for two reasons. First, there's no real consensus on what makes a value stock a value stock. And second, the portfolios of fundamental strategies shift and make direct analysis a difficult and moving target. Currently, I think as this table shows, most fundamental strategies tilt towards value against the S&P 500 with lower PEs, PBs, and higher dividend yields. I note that that isn't true of RSP, the equal weighted ETF, which has both a higher PE ratio and a lower dividend yield than SPY. I think this lines up with a lot of ways people use RSP, which is actually to take on a bit more risk in the market. One side effect of something like equal weighting is that you're putting money in smaller stocks and, uh, and less money into the larger stocks. And I think this is one of the biggest determinants of returns. It's also been a very positive determinant of return recently. Uh, Wharton professor Jeremy Siegel says that the top 20 stocks in the S&P 500 have underperformed the index by more than 150 basis points per year over the past 50 years. It's sort of the curse of the largest companies. And the table above, which I actually did crib from Ridex, uh, sort of accords with that. It examines the 2000 to 2010 performance of the S&P 500 securities broken out into market cap quintiles. In other words, that first column on the left looks at the 100 largest stocks in the S&P 500, and the column all the way on the right looks at the 100 smallest stocks. In this case, for the past decade at least, performance was directly in line with the size, or inversely related, with the size of the security. Let's dig a bit deeper into performance before we open things up into Q&A. I'm going to look mostly at U.S. large cap stocks because those have the longest track record of real performance. So how have these indexes actually fared in the market? The answer is, as you might expect, it depends on what period you look at. So as mentioned, RSP, since it launched in 2003, has outperformed the S&P 500 handily. That's what you see on this chart. RSP is up about 106%, and the S&P is up only 61%. Since PRF, the Rob Arnott fundamentally weighted ETF, entered the market in 2005, it is also outperformed, beating the S&P 500 by 11% and just edging out RSP since inception. Similarly, during the last year, both of these strategies have delivered strong returns, easily topping SPY. But the assumption that that's always the case just doesn't hold up. During the most recent market crash, both RSP and PRF underperformed the market. From January 1, 2008 through the March 9th bottom, RSP lost 55.6%, PRF lost 56.9%, and S&P beat them both, being down just 52.3%. It's important to note that while some people think of these alternative strategies as safer alternatives, they do not protect you from all major market downturns. 
Now, the reason they underperformed in 2008, I think, varies by index, and it speaks to their tilts on the market. PRF suffered mostly from a substantial overweight to the financial sector, while RSP suffered in part because of its rebalancing strategy, which is typically effective in harvesting profits, forced it to continually invest and invest in stocks that were trending down over a long period of time. That helped when the market reversed, but on the way down, it wasn't so much fun. Let's look back over the last three years, which covers the most recent market crisis, as well as the recovery, because that lets us look at different alternative weighting strategies. The results are mixed and, I think, interesting. Dividend-based ETFs like DLN dramatically underperformed the market during this period as the collapse in the financial sector ravaged their returns. Earnings-weighted ETFs delivered results nearly in line with cap-weighted indexes, although they did it with a smaller drawdown and significantly lower volatility, which is exactly what you'd like to see. Revenue-weighted ETFs solidly outperform both on absolute returns and risk-adjusted returns. And among fundamental strategies, the four-factor RAFI model actually did the best. Despite having the largest worst-case drawdown and significantly higher volatility than under other fundamental strategies, it delivered very strong outperformance as a significant and persistent overallocation to financials drove results higher during the recovery. At the top of the heap, for this session at least, was the S&P 500 equal weight ETF, RSP, which trumped all other funds on absolute returns by a wide margin. That high return was not without costs, however, as RSP had the highest volatility of all strategies, as well as the largest worst-case drawdown. One final thought on performance. One suggestion I've heard for, from investors recently is that they might blend alternative and cap-weighted indexing strategies in a single portfolio to, quote, unquote, diversify their weighting risk. Honestly, to me, this just smeaks, smacks of marketing speak. We can discuss this on our panel, but in our analysis, there was little real diversification benefit to pairing one way of weighting the top 500 stocks in the U.S. market with another. The correlations are high across the board, so the classic benefits of diversification seemingly do not apply. If you want to diversify your portfolio, you have to diversify your holdings. Diversifying your weighting strategy means maybe you just aren't making up your mind. So what do we do with all this information? How do you know if one of these strategies is right for you? Well, let's break it down. In theory, cap-weighted indexes should outperform most alternatives, particularly when the market favors large cap or growth stocks or when bubbles are starting to form. They will underperform, typically, when the reverse is true. It is true that in back testing stretching back over decades, cap-weighted indexes had lower returns and lower risk-adjusted returns than either fundamental or equal-weighted strategies in most regimes. The real exception was the formation of the technology bubble when cap-weighted indexes did very well. As always, the benefits of low costs and real tax efficiency uh, weigh in favor of cap-weighted indexes. Equal-weighted strategies tilt down the market cap spectrum compared to both cap and fundamental indexes. Therefore, they should deliver the best performance of the three approaches when small caps are outperforming. They can be used also by investors when they want to take on more risk in a market. I also personally find equal weighting strategies interesting in emerging markets. I think there's a real and emerging risk that market cap weighted emerging market indexes will focus attention on large multinational corporations, firms that happen to be located in Korea or China, but which market to the same global economy and the same customers as Coke, GE, and Boeing. Alternative strategies, either equal or fundamentally weighted, help investors move down the cap spectrum and tap into smaller, more locally oriented companies. Fans of market cap weighting can achieve similar results by investing more in mid and small cap securities, but I expect this will be a theme you hear more about in the coming years. The fundamental indexes have a tilt down the market cap spectrum, not as big as equal weighting, but still big compared to market cap weighting, and they also have a more pronounced value tilt. They'll generally outperform both cap-weighted and equal-weighted indexes when value is outperforming, and they may also perform, outperform a cap-weighted index when small caps are doing well. Both fundamental and equal-weighted indexes can sidestep some market bubbles. That's a benefit, although the way they were routed in the financial crisis shows they are not immune from certain serious market downfalls. In summary, 
Alternatively weighted indexes have often, but not always, outperformed traditional cap weighted indexes in recent market history. Backtesting suggests that they may deliver higher returns over the long run, albeit with higher volatility in many cases. There is no free lunch at the alternative indexing buffet. Much of the outperformance has come from a tilt down the market cap spectrum and for fundamental strategies, a value tilt, both of which have delivered strong returns over the time period we looked at. Backtesting also suggests that relative performance is regime dependent, which can be used to the advantage of someone who can predict relative performance of styles, market cap bands, or sectors. As I see advisors using these products, and I want to hear from our panelists on this, I see them doing it in different ways. Some advisors are replacing their market cap betas entirely. Some are using these strategies tactically, shifting between market cap indexes and alternative indexes, depending on how they think the market is trending. And some, of course, aren't using them at all. Regardless, I think investors should take the time to look under the hood. The academic and theoretical arguments about different weighting strategies, which have occupied so much of the press for so long, are interesting. But much of the performance here is actually driven by classic market cap vectors like sector, size, and style. And it pays to do that analysis uh, before you buy in. Uh, with that, I'd love to bring in my esteemed panelists to get some perspectives on how they use alternative strategies or how they see them being used in portfolios. I certainly have some questions of my own, but I'd like to remind the audience that you can enter questions into the Q&A web interface at any time, and we'll collate those and ask them of our panelists. So I'm going to start with Christian. Um, and Christian, my, you know, you, you heard my talk, and my first question to you is just, just a practical one about how you use uh, alternatively weighted indexes and, and ETFs in your own portfolios. And to keep my legal team uh, happy that we are long RSP and have been a long RSP since, since April of 2009. Um, as a global macro manager, we're really looking at the world as a whole and making a determination on whether or not we're going to be invested in stocks. And then the second thing that we have a tendency to look at is whether or not a capital-weighted index or an equal-weighted index is really in favor. And we do, we do that primarily with uh, the analysis of a relative strength metric that we've developed. Um, what we use the index for is making a determination when capital-weighted indexes are in favor. We generally use those to determine that uh, it's probably time to get a little bit more defensive on our equity allocations. At least history has proven that. When equal-weighted indices are in favor, we actually either can do it can play it actually two ways. One is we can reduce our allocation to the S&P 500 capital-weighted type benchmark and increase in other areas that are going to provide us with more alpha. Uh, last year, for example, the, the, uh, the trading delta on the difference between SPY and RSP was about 30% um, less of an RSP holding got, got you exactly the same performance of SPY. So we allocated our client money into, into alternatives like the metals and, and international and, and significantly outperformed the market that way. So that's one way that we look to use the the, uh, the equal-weighted strategies. So, Christian, this is a question from the audience. Um, you know, what what specifically do you look at to to determine when, as you said, equal weighting is is in fashion or uh, is needed? I mean, what what's the signal? Well, I mean, there's a couple of different things yet we look at. Really, on a macro basis, is uh, where are we as far as the market trends and in the stage of a market? Have we have we gone three years of a bull market and are we beginning to see? some breakdowns in, in what we determine to be some of the leading stocks. Uh, that usually gives us an, an indicator that capital weight is going to come up. Uh, we also use relative strength. Relative strength is probably the biggest driver. And what I would advise people to look at when it comes to analyzing relative strength is throw out your daily charts on relative strength and pay attention to the weekly and monthly indicators. Uh, and that's going to get you more of, an, uh, more of a sense of whether or not these two securities are, are performing in line with each other. And then you can take the extra time and, and measure the rate of change of the delta in those and how they trade differently. And that can give you an indication of when, when you should be looking at those as well. Tony, I want to turn that to you. I mean, Christian mentioned one way he's using these strategies, switching sort of back and forth. Uh, how do you hear of advisors uh, using equal-weighted strategies, at least in their portfolios? What are the different uh, methods that they use them in? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, I'm certainly uh, – in sync with you. I, I don't believe that it makes an awful lot of sense to combine 
equal weighted and cap weighted if you're trying to get index uh, type exposures. Uh, and I would say that more and more where we're spending our time and effort is really educating people on equal weight. We believe it is a viable alternative not only to cap weighted, but we've actually done the uh, analysis to really look at how the returns stack up relative to most active managers. And we would argue that it absolutely is, is very competitive in that space. And we would argue it represents a better beta or a better core, better way of getting market exposure. Uh, but to the extent uh, advisors do have the wherewithal and they're finding consistent alpha and consistent excess return in certain managers, I could certainly see, and we've had individuals who have mentioned using us as a core and then marrying that with an active manager. But uh, I think more and more there is a lot of difficulty to find persistence of alpha out there, and I think more and more advisors are starting to think of this as a, a smarter way of getting that core exposure. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, we, you know, I outlined a, a bunch of different tilts that these products make on the market. They also have their rebalancing strategy. Uh, what do you think really uh, drives the strong returns we've seen and what maybe are the risks where this strategy might go awry? Yeah, there's a couple things. I mean, one is we have looked at the historical data. We've not only looked at it for RSP, which, as you mentioned, goes back to 2003. We introduced equal weight sector strategies in 2006. And then more recently, we introduced MSCI products trying to get global exposure and Russell products really trying to get exposure up and down the cap spectrum. And one of the consistent sort of attributes or a series of consistent attributes that we see are we do see superior risk-adjusted results. While the standard deviation might be higher, we actually look at other risk statistics like upside capture and alpha and beta and sharp ratio when we see a persistence in superior risk adjusted results. We think that's attributable to a couple things. One is clearly you're taking away the big concentration risk. Right? You're not dependent on the performance of a handful of stocks. You're actually spreading your risks more intelligently. Clearly, we also benefit then from small and mid-cap names within the uh, constituents that contribute more to the overall portfolio. But one of the unique things uh, that, that I don't think gets enough attention is this rebalancing. And I go back to your comments about Rob Arnott and you know the, the criticism of the traditional cap is you overweight the overvalued and underweight the undervalued. The quarterly rebalancing that we employ really uh, provides a discipline whereby we're selling high and we're buying low. And that, I think, has really helped us quite a bit over time. One of the criticisms you brought up was the fact that some of the fundamental uh, indices end up looking very value-oriented. Although we would admit that there is a little bit of a value tilt in the portfolio, depending on the market environment, we might have more of a growth tilt or more of a value tilt. So that dynamic discipline rebalancing, we attribute a lot of the excess return to. That's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, Follow-up from the audience, actually, immediately on that is, is why quarterly? Uh, is that enough? Do you need it more often, less often? Uh, how is that chosen? Yeah, I think quarterly makes sense. If, if you did it much more frequently than that, you would incur a lot more transaction cost, and it, it might force you to sell uh, winning names or those that are doing well in the portfolio more frequently than you need to be. Uh, but as we've looked at it, again, and we've looked at it uh, for not only the S&P, which has been in the market since 2003, but the MSCI and the Russells, and it really has shown some pretty consistent results across the board. So we think that's kind of the right time period. Interesting. Christian, I have a great question from the audience, which is this. If I'm an advisor and I already have an asset allocation tied to you know, small, mid, and large cap stocks and a, a tilt towards value and a tilt towards growth, um, if I throw in one of these alternative weighting strategies, doesn't that, doesn't that throw everything off? Doesn't it make it very difficult to manage your overall portfolio allocations? I don't really believe that it does. I, I think that... Uh, Although when we're looking at the weighting of like an RSP on a capital weighted basis, if we look at the capital weighted index, the, the average capitalization across all 500 stocks is about $44 billion. Bring it down to RSP, and RSP on, on an equal weighted basis is about $11, $11 billion. So it becomes a little more, more mid-cappy. Um, I really believe that an equal weighted strategy, as, as Tony said, and should really not be combined with a capital-weighted strategy. I think it really needs to be one or the other. Um, mixing the two together doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and uh, finding that balance makes a lot of sense. I also would, would advise people from the, from the advisor side, this is something very new to talk to your prospects and clients about. Um, 
a lot of people aren't even aware that there are two different ways to invest in the S&P 500. Now you've got something brand new to talk to people about, and I really think that's, a, that's an excellent way to open doors and get newer, newer prospects and clients in the door. Right, right. One interesting, you know, you, you, on the idea of pairing, one question we got from the audience was, is there a trading strategy here that, you know, that pairs uh, an equal-weighted strategy or a fundamentally-weighted strategy against a cap-weighted alternative? Is that something you ever hear, Tony? We, we do hear some people uh, looking at that, and, and frankly, we have to spend a little bit more time thinking about that. I, I think not only with you know an RSP versus an S&P, but I think with the sector strategies in particular, if you have certain sector views, I, I think they would be conducive to trading strategies. Right. Interesting. I'm going to give a, an academic question that came out of the weeds from the audience, which is this. And this goes to you, Tony, uh, so put on your, your, your academic hat. It said, I read an article in the Journal of Indexes several months ago that made the case that value and growth were actually driven by sector rotations, that that was what drove the performance. Um, can you or even Christian you know, talk to that point and how you think about you know, value and growth as components in the market, and, and are they legitimate drivers of returns, or is it just sectors in disguise? Gosh, I, I think that's a, a, a tough question only in the sense that I, I think there's some blurriness around what is even value and growth. And I know that a lot of the indices that, you know, people look at, you know, you'll see, you know, is Microsoft a value or a growth stock? Things will rotate over time depending on the, the portfolio characteristics. So I, I'm not sure I know the, the study that uh, – the respondent is referring to, and I'm not sure that I really have a view on that. I, I would, I would just maybe turn it around and say, we think in owning the market, it's important to own the market, and definitionally, you need to decide what that market is. There are certain periods of time where individual securities or individual sectors have more value and growth components, and I, I think historically we've thought of technology is clearly a growth sector. It isn't always the case, but we, we tend to think of it that way. And energy and utilities tend to be more value-oriented sectors. But individual names within that could have different uh, underlying characteristics. Right. Let me, let me uh, remind the audience. Oh, go ahead, Kristen. Yeah. Uh, I think, Matt, on, on the concept of value and growth investing, um, uh, again, Tony brings up Microsoft. Uh, is it a value stock? Is it a growth stock? Well, it, it's now a value stock. It was a growth stock. Right. Um, it's it's kind of looking at um, I, I think it's kind of an interesting dichotomy with the, with the, uh, the crash in 2000. Uh, tech stocks kind of, you know, those were our growth stocks that became value stocks. And what led us out of that mess literally happened to be the value stocks that became growth stocks, which were the bank stocks. And now we started this thing all over again. So part of that equal weighting strategy, which is so interesting, is it's, it's a harvesting strategy as well. So the right. rebalancing forces the investor to, 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 to do the things that's most uncomfortable, and that is sell when things are going up. Yeah, no, it's certainly, uh, certainly discipline in that sense. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting question. Most of my presentation focused on large caps. Um, but, Christian, do you find this interesting in, in the small cap space and other areas of the market? Is this something you'd consider uh, doing you know, for small caps as you do for large Absolutely. When when we look at the market, we actually run two models. We run a, gro a global macro all asset class ETF model. Then we want to run a very very growthy uh, equity mid cap model. Uh, and what still happens to get people's um, interest are these growth stocks. And I take you know a particular interest in taking look at an RSP and the way it's weighted to growth stocks versus the way it's weighted to the larger cap companies. I'll use the granddaddy of them all as a great example. I mean, General Electric is the only original stock in the, in the Dow Jones. Why we even pay attention to the Dow on a daily basis, I still I, I still don't understand. But yesterday, <laughs> I had a great day because of IBM. But from an example perspective, GE has been in the index, the S&P 500 index forever. It's been a major component. I think it's three or four right now. 2008, Priceline gets added has one-tenth of the allocation that General Electric has at the time of the addition. General Electric, since that time period, 2008, has, has provided to some, the investor with a negative return of 25%. Priceline's provided that same investor with a positive return of over 350%. Small cap, mid cap, whatever it may be, you can't beat the S&P 500 by being the index, but an equal-weighted strategy allows you to do that. Tony, let me turn that over to you. Are there not liquidity concerns if we move into, say, an equal-weighted small-cap index where you'd be plowing 
Yeah, really, if a, if a fund got successful, a lot of money into some really tiny companies. Are there any liquidity issues there? You know, it's something we have looked at and we don't believe so. We, and I would say the two markets where that's probably, you know, the most pronounced would be in looking at the Russell 2000. We do have a strategy that's smaller names. And then, of course, we do have an emerging market. And I'd love to come back and, and just kind of touch on that if we have a chance. But we have done kind of the reverse engineering of that. And we feel very comfortable there's ample liquidity in the marketplace. Um, I did want to remind people as, as well, and I, Matt, I think you did a super job laying out all of all of the things that have gone on in the market in the historical perspective here, we have also created a white paper uh, which we'll send out to all the participants. But that is one of the issues we do address in the white paper. And again, we would argue there is ample liquidity uh, given the underlying strategies. And we have gone through the reverse engineering to determine at what size you know we might be concerned about it. But we have a long, long ways to go on that. And Matt, again, the other issue here is a lot of folks need to understand the difference between underlying liquidity and then volume in an ETF. And I think that's very misunderstood these days. By what you mean? Well, essentially, if you look at some of these equal weighted strategies, such as um, RightX has a great equal weighted strategy called um, it's an equal weighted utility strategy, which which doesn't trade many shares at all, but the underlying securities trade plenty of volume. Uh, but those strategies are avoided because advisors are looking and saying, what's the daily volume on this? Volume in, in will be created uh, in the event that there's trading in those particular areas. And the spreads on these securities have gotten very, very tight over the years. Certainly true. Um, well, let's talk about fundamental strategies for a bit, Christian. Do any of those appeal for you, or, or, or why, why not if they don't? Uh, Dividend-weighted, uh, RAFI, et cetera. We actually use some fundamental strategies, particularly um, we, we happen to like some of the Wisdom Tree product. Uh, and uh, we, we like it in certain areas, uh, primarily in areas where we might be able to get what we would term to be um, an interesting ability to do two things, such as invest in emerging markets and at the same time be small cap with, with, a, with a dividend play. And those, that's out there. And, and, you know, looking at finding a particular security that's going to perform one, more than one duty in your portfolio is very important. That's the beauty of some of these exchange-traded products is that you can really do that. Right. Let's turn that over to you, Tony. I mean, I touched on it in the slides. And, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty cap-weighted traditional guy. Um, but I do find these strategies interesting in emerging markets. And, I, you know, I know you wanted to, to, to touch on that. Give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and precisely the way that, that you thought about it, we, what we think is really exciting, and emerging markets, one of those areas that we, we really get uh, very excited when we begin to think about it, because if you want to get exposure in the emerging markets, you really want uh, to pure play what's really happening in those underlying companies and those underlying economies. And I think the example that you were alluding to is think of South Korea. Uh, you don't want to have Samsung really dominating the return because that's clearly a multinational. And the cap-weighted rewards those larger names that really don't act and exhibit the characteristics that you expect to get out of those emerging economies. So we're actually very excited about equal weighting the emerging market. Oh, by the way, that was 600 basis points better than the cap-weighted equivalent last year. And as we've looked at the results and we've compared it versus the universe of active managers, we would say equal weight stacks up very, very well because we are actually getting what's happening in those exciting and dynamic countries. Right. Interesting. And, and Christian, maybe you can speak to why you went with the Wisdom Tree dividend model as opposed to maybe an r not model or an earnings model or, or an equal weighted strategy in, in the emerging markets. Well, we happen to like the simple fact that in that particular instance, um, a lot of the, the extra hard work was already being done by the team of, of Wisdom Tree uh, and looking to make sure that we were breaking down and we're looking at investing in emerging markets that for a lot of investors is a scary thing to do in the first place. So we're going to go and we're going to, we're going to invest and allow the team at Wisdom Tree to break down and find us those companies that actually do have earnings and are generating profits and are paying out dividends. Uh, and that gives us a little bit more safety and a little bit more comfort uh, that we're picking the right companies in the underlying ETF in those investments. Right. I've I've also heard some advisors express concern about uh, fundamental factors that aren't as concrete as dividends in emerging markets. I mean, we know the 
you know, accounting standards here, and uh, and you, you take that overseas, and, and who knows what PEs and PBs you're getting out. And that's a very interesting point, but there are also some emerging markets that I'm a heck of a lot more comfortable with their PEs and their mathematics and calculations and fiscal responsibility than I am here in the U.S. You know, that's, take that's Chile, it. for an example. That's absolutely true. So, Tony, I'm going to ask a, a, a basic question. You know, we have John Bogle's argument, uh, there's a winner for every loser. So if, if we grant that equal was the winner and, and fundamental was the winner, at least recently, um, who's the loser? Who's taking the sucker side of this bet? Well, you know, I mean, not to be critical, but I do think, you know, cap-weighted, you're, you're having somebody make that decision for you. I, I'm a little hard-pressed. There will clearly be periods of time where cap-weighting is better, and, and I should get that out on the table. I think you pointed out in a mega-cap rally, uh, cap-weighted will be the winner because you're, you're making big bets on a handful of names. But I would argue for most environments that we're living through and for most investors who are choosing to own the market, they're going to be better served e either in an equal-weighted fashion or fundamentally weighted fashion because you're removing that big concentrated bet. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. But even if we, if we create a spectrum where we grant that equals winning and cap is in the middle, there must be someone on the other side. Is that is that active, or is that individual investors, or or you know? <laughs> I I, th I think I think it's clearly active has has had a very difficult time. I, I think that uh, that's why we've seen the extraordinary growth in the ETF business. A lot of people have come to the realization active managers do have a difficult time. Now, with that said, I, I would point out as an organization, we have both active and passive strategies. We think that some will be successful, but I, but I think the ability to consistently identify and generate alpha is, is a very difficult game. So I think active managers have certainly paid a price over the last couple of years. I think we've all seen all the studies looking at the individual investor making the wrong decisions at the wrong time. I think, unfortunately, that still exists today. So we would argue we just want to have a seat at the table. We think we're offering a more rational way of getting exposure and owning the market, however and wherever we decide that market should be. But, uh, now, but I think, unfortunately, have... you're right that there will be uh, losers for, for all the winners in the space. That's, it's it's, it's got to be. This is a question from the audience that gets towards the, you know, the, the alpha claims of the equal-weighted strategy. So it's for you as well, Tony. If you did a, a classic factor analysis, say, from a French, and you accounted for value and size, is there still significantly significant alpha, or is most of that accounted for by those very tilts? Have you done that study? We haven't done it exactly that way, but, it, but again, in the white paper that we'll share with everyone, we have dissected the returns, and we've looked at the returns over time. And one of the things that we clearly pick up on is this uh, sell high, buy low. In other words, you know, as the value stocks and the value sectors are appreciated in the portfolio and we're forced to trim and we buy low, we're actually benefiting from that. We also, as we've dissected the returns, we've looked at it, and there are periods of times where the portfolio is more growth-oriented or more value-oriented. So we think that systematic rebalancing is adding significant value above and beyond just, you know, the fundamental sort of factors. Right. I'm going to do a trading in the weeds question, and, and Tony and Christian, I'll let you both jump on this, but this is from the audience as well. Um, I, we know that the creation redemption process works and typically keeps these things trading at relatively low spreads, but does the fact that there aren't uh, significant equal-weighted futures make something like RSP trade at wider spreads since it's uh, more challenging perhaps for the APs to hedge? I, I don't believe so. I, I think RSP is a mature product, and I think it trades relatively tight. I think, uh, as, as Christian alluded to earlier, sometimes younger products or newer strategies, uh, people look at the trading volume and they're, they're hesitant to jump into the market because the concern is underlying liquidity. Again, we would argue the liquidity is more dependent on the liquidity of the underlying rather than the daily trading volume. So I think as an industry, we need to do a better job educating people on that. Uh, but as we've worked with our our APs, and we've sat down and kind of go through portfolio construction, I think everyone's very comfortable with the ability to sufficiently hedge, and uh, that should not impact bid-ask spreads whatsoever. What we're seeing right now, Matt, is that bid-ask spreads are about the same these days. Volume con continues to be um, lower on the equal-weighted strategies. However, we are seeing some interest from institutional investors in equal-weighted strategies and moving away from the old capital-weighted index. Uh, and that's been very, very interesting in, in the last 18 months. 
Interesting. I'll remind the audience to toss in your questions by Q&A. We have time for a few more. Uh, here's one product idea for you from the audience. Um, maybe you've studied this. What about equal weighting countries? What about an equal weighted EFA? Um, you know, we've seen stock and sector weights uh, equaled out. What about a country weighted uh, equal weighted version? We are looking at a, a number of things. We're, we're big believers in equal weight. And, uh, you know, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, we are spending a lot of time looking at different ways of getting exposure, whether it's equal weighting countries or maybe looking at a particular country in equal weighting to get that market exposure. So we're exploring a number of uh, different ways of expanding our equal weight family. Interesting. Now, let, let me ask you a practical question, Christian. We have a large audience of advisors listening to this. Uh, when I've written about RSP, I was actually I was making fun of uh, it winning five stars from Morningstar, not because it's a great fund, just because um, you know it won those stars because it had outperformed, um, and, and that just seems silly. And I called it the idiot savant of outperformance. So my my question for you is, um, when you sit down and talk to clients, do you ever get the question of, you know, isn't this just too simple, or how do you how do you convey um, you know the value that you think equal weighting uh, brings to the portfolio and and counter what maybe maybe never comes up but I could see being something someone would ask well I think the beauty of equal weighting is its simplicity and we happen to believe that uh, there are two strategies that have worked time and time again in the investing spectrum and that happens to be first and foremost buying stocks that grow their dividends every year that's a fairly simple strategy but it works wonderfully over the long haul, equal weighting is also a fairly simple strategy. So explaining it to a, to a client, I really think it's more about the, the American growth story and the economy and, and looking at companies uh, like an Apple that, haven't, that really hasn't been in the S&P 500 that long. But I'll tell you what, in the last 10 years, Apple's just a little bit better than Microsoft. Uh, so, and, it, and it really plays more into that growth story in the economy uh, and then we get into these great big gorillas like ExxonMobil and General Electric um, that really don't have the ability to make the quick moves when times get tough to cut staff or, or whatever they need to do to grow aggressively. So I really think the equal weighting strategy plays into just the entire U.S. economy. Now, I'm, I'm a rah-rah U.S. anyway. However, I think equal weighting allows the investor to participate more in the small to mid-cap size and beat that S&P 500 benchmark and still be invested in, in the same companies, just different weightings. Right. Um, Tony, I'm going to throw one back to you. I, I mentioned that you know these strategies haven't paid significant capital gains distributions, um, but is that a risk? Should we be concerned about that in certain market environments? Could that happen? Yeah, well, we would never uh, guarantee that not to be the case. Look at RSP. We've been in the market since 2003, and we haven't paid anything. So um, I, I think it is unique to the structure, and I, and I know that you mentioned that. We would argue the structure uh, makes this very appealing. And, and I think, as you're aware, equal weight has been an institutional strategy for many, many years, and the challenge has always been, how can you offer this in a in a solution that really makes sense? And I think the ETF structure is the most elegant way of packaging it uh, because you will have slightly higher transaction costs than cap weighted. Uh, but I think because of the unique ETF structure and the creation and redemption process and the in kind transfer, we have uh, we've historically I think you know been very pleased with the results. I, I would never say never, uh, but we've been very pleased with how it's performed. And we've Here's been one pleased. question. Yeah, no, the, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think, I think the ETF wrapper is a great one for you. Um, one thing I did want to raise before we run out of time is, you know, we certainly have seen equal-weighted sector strategies, but we haven't seen those caught, catch on much with advisors um, yet. Maybe, Christian, you can speak to why uh, you do or do not use equal-weighted sector strategies, and, and, Tony, what you think the outlook is there and what's, what's maybe holding those funds back. We've traditionally made the, that decision at a macro level to be either equal weighted or capital weighted, and if at all possible, I think at the beginning of your of the webinar today, you mentioned there were 76 equal weighted strategies out there, and they're from Ridex, and, and uh, there are some from from um, State Street and, and many others. Um, we happen to think that uh, if we're going to overweight a sector, that finding an equal weighted strategy when we believe equal weighted is is in play is an absolute benefit. Um, last year, just the utility sector in itself was an interesting play, uh, 
Um, obviously, because of the simple fact that, that uh, it paid a great dividend during a time when uh, when yields continue to fall. So we thought that there was definitely some upside there. But uh, we like to use those equal-weighted strategies as much as we can. Um, there's a lot of banking strategies that are equal-weighted. There's some insurance strategies, metal strategies that are equal-weighted. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for us. And Tony, is, there's one concern that was rent mentioned by the audience is do the, the sector funds get too narrow? Uh, if you only have you know, 30 or 40 names, is, is, is that an appropriate place for an equal-weighted strategy? We think so. Again, you know, just the, the pure dominance. So if you're cap weighted, you know, would you want to have a handful of names? I, I know there's a lot of press the other day uh, looking at, you know, when it looked like Steve Jobs was uh, had some health issues and Apple was down. And I, I don't know the numbers exactly, but I think it was uh, Apple represented 21% of the queues. Well, it's, clearly that's a concentrated risk. Um, but I, but I think that equal weighting takes away some of the concentrated risk, and I, and I think that's obviously a favorable thing. Uh, with respect to the question you asked, Christian, I, I think that's a great question. I, I would argue we're still early. The, the ETF business is still taking hold. We still have a lot of converts coming from people who built portfolios using active managers. So it's still the early innings. And, and I would argue that today, I think the first way that people think about getting exposure is they want to own the market. And again, however we define that market. Uh, but then I think as, as people kind of uh, get more investment savvy, they'll look to make, as Kristen has this, described, maybe you're going to make sector calls. You know, you can either use sectors to overweight or to underweight sectors. So you start to decompose the market or to make sector bets on top of owning the market. So I would argue it's still early innings, and we still need to work with advisors on how to best use these really incredible tools that we've given them. And uh, I, I suspect we'll see a lot more evolution over time. Well, I... Uh I think uh, I think that's going to wrap it up. I think we've run out of time, um, but that was a great last word, Tony. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank my panelists, Tony Davidow and Christian Wagner, for their helpful insights. I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for your attention. As a reminder, both these slides and an audio recording of this webinar will be made available at the Index Universe website in a few days. Everyone who registered for this webinar will be sent an email alerting you when they're up and ready for, for review. Um, for those of you who registered for CE credits, information on how to gain those credits will be sent to you in that very email when we announce that the webinar has been posted. I want to remind everyone to keep checking Index Universe for upcoming webinars, including one in late February on emerging markets. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Ridex, Tony, Christian, and everyone out there. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, everyone.